Yes. Um, that's a great point, and uh, I actually just wrote a piece for the Huffington Post, which I gave, which actually talks about that. Arthur Schlesinger had this whole cycles of history theory about exactly that, that we go through these cycles. Um, I actually think it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. I think if we did have a more uh, universal, voluntary national service system, we would stay more engaged in public purpose. Because people would have, it's part of the reason I've been such a big believer in this, and I've spent a lot of my life working towards it, what I've seen from City Year and from AmeriCorps, and there's now studies that show this, uh, if you spend a year full time working on uh, issues of inequality or poverty or educational opportunity or the environment, um, you turn on what I like to call your justice nerve. Uh, I think everybody has it. And sometimes it gets turned on early, sometimes it gets turned on late, sometimes it never gets turned on. But basically, if you come face to face with injustice, it's almost part of your DNA. This is true all over the world for people. You see it in times of crisis. You want to do something about it. And what I've seen is if you spend a year full time engaged, day after day, your justice nerve gets turned on. And then it doesn't go off once it's turned on. We, you know, we have studies of our alumni. City alumni vote at much higher rates than their peer groups. They continue to volunteer at much higher rates. They lead others into service at much higher rates. They maintain friendships with people from different backgrounds at much higher rates. They become better citizens. Um, and AmeriCorps just did a big study that also tracks that. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the way we could sort of, it's, you know, when we were in college and law school, you know, we used to talk about national service as the missing link in our democracy. I mean, you know, how do you make citizenship real for people? Active duty, not just studying in the classroom. I mean, a lot of you said you took this course because you wanted a practical experience. Well, a year of service actually gives you a practical experience in working on the needs of your community and your country and your world. So I think that would help a lot. I mean, it's interesting. We talk about the greatest generation. That's like now four generations ago. I mean, from, you know, it's your great grandparents' generation. Think about it. Why are they the greatest generation? And why haven't we had one since? Because the whole generation got pulled into service. Either through the Depression, through World War II. Um, you know, men went off to fight the war. Women went into the workplace. They did the rubber drives, the tin drives. It was, everybody was in it together. And we still revere that generation, you know, from now 75 years ago. Um, so I think if we had this, every generation could become a greatest generation because you would have worked together. I mean, a lot of you raised the issue of education. You know, imagine if we had a million, I mean, 35,000 people apply to Teach for America this year. They've got enough money for 5,000 spots. You know, there are 3 million public school classrooms in this country. Imagine if we had a million people from your generation going into public school classrooms. That would even just cover a third of them. Um, and how would that do in terms of, A, the impact, and then, B, the generational commitment to, I mean, it's not a surprise that there are so many alumni of TFA that are on the cutting edge of education reform, whether it's Michelle Rhee in DC or the folks that founded KIPP or other efforts. Um, so that's what I think, you know, how, how we could actually reclaim that. Yes? Okay, um, what's your opinion about sort of the, the way that AmeriCorps and also SEER is, is funded in terms of money flowing like through the government into basically paying people to do service even though it's a small stipend? And how does that get reconciled politically? Yeah, um, you know, this has been an issue that's come up. And, and uh, if you want to have a diverse program, if you want this to be something that's universally available, people have to get, and you want people to be able to do it full time. And I do think there is a qualitative difference when you are full-time engaged in, in an activity than part-time or episodically. I believe in volunteerism. I think it's important for people to, to volunteer. But I do think if you actually do it full-time, it's, it's, it's a different level of commitment and learning and engagement. And we've got studies that show that now. If you're going to do that, people have to get paid something. How do they pay their rent? How do they you know, ride the tea? How do they get their, pay for their lunch? Um, so there's got to be some kind of stipend. Uh, connected to that, unless you want to leave it just to the wealthiest of the wealthy, and you know that that defeats the purpose because the idea is that everybody should be involved in this. So, uh, and you know, in other areas of public service, we have the all volunteer army, and they get paid, and they should. We have firefighters and police officers and teachers, and they get paid, and they should. Members of Congress are public servants; they're doing public; they get paid, and they should. So there's been this thing about well. 
people doing AmeriCorps, why should they get paid? If they're full time, how are they going to live? So again, I don't think it should be, and most people who are doing AmeriCorps could get paid, you know, I mean, senior corps members could work at McDonald's and actually make more money. Now, they wouldn't have as good an experience and they're not contributing to the society. So um, I think it's essential if you want to achieve the goals. Yes? Do you think there's some sort of conflict in public service Um, I, I think we need to do both, and you know this comes up a lot. Is city or for the core members or for the kids we serve? What I learned over time is that uh, if you focus on the people you're serving, you have a better experience. So uh, it, it's sort of a false choice. So if I mean what I came to was that uh, it's the needs of the people you're serving that need to come first. But that's where people grow the most, because that's where they're having the biggest impact. Um, that's where they learn the most. That's where they develop the most. So I think, so that's the first thing. In terms of solving the problem, um, I don't think that national service can solve every problem in the country, but it can make a huge difference. And what it does then is turn on people's commitment to then want to solve the problem. It's not a surprise that people who do a year in AmeriCorps are more engaged and are more committed, and they learn stuff. I mean, part of the theory of this is that, you know, you have to, and, and somebody mentioned it, you know, the lack of a commitment to change or the apathy. Um, and you would actually get, and you also get new ideas. So it's not, uh, you know, people like me who believe in national service aren't saying we should do national service and nothing else. But you need some kind of citizen engagement, I think. Uh, as a piece of an overall solution. And then you also need more systemic and ongoing supports. And the people who do it are going to come up with those ideas, too. Yes? What's the relationship between fear and fear Because it kind of seems like um, citizen fear is the model on which Um, okay, I'll try to answer that briefly. Uh, <coughs> CityEar is an AmeriCorps program. The way AmeriCorps works, which I actually think is a real model and a breakthrough, is it's not one big federal government program. Instead, it's supporting now over 2,000 local, state, and national initiatives. Things like CityEar, Jumpstart Citizen Schools, Youth Build, Teach for America, and on and on and on. Um, I think that's part of the reason why it's been successful. Um, so, and, and so AmeriCorps itself is made up of all these different programs. So there is a there's a role for both. Part of our goal in starting City was to be this action tank, to inspire this larger commitment to national service. And one of the things I learned from my city experience and now from my Be the Change experience is that uh, an organization, and, and one of the things that, that is going in the social entrepreneurship movement now, and I've been pushing people, and my wife Vanessa is pushing people, is if you are, if you are going to be a social entrepreneur, you should have an action tank side to what you're doing. If you want to have a big impact, um, you know, for example, City Year is now 1,500 core members. AmeriCorps is 75,000. Now, City Year is important because it's a model and it helps to, you know, set standards and 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 be out in front. But it's small compared to what AmeriCorps is. But you know, you can make an argument that AmeriCorps wouldn't have happened without City Year. Um, what I've learned would be the change is that uh, if you're going to affect the system as a whole, you know, action tanks, individual organizations can help bring about new ideas. But if you want to scale them, which is what just happened with the Serve America Act, you need to do meta-action tanking. And what I mean by that is you've got to build a coalition. You've got to get people to work together. You've got to get people out of their silos, which is one of the issues in the social entrepreneurship movement. This came up. Somebody said about you know, focusing on your organization, versus your clients, or you know, my partner. Part of the reason I, I decided to leave City was really Michael's insight of the social entrepreneur's trap. Most social entrepreneurs start the organization because they want a larger movement for change. Jeff Canada wants a movement to fight poverty. Wendy Kopp wants a movement for education reform. Dorothy Stoneman wants a movement for uh, opportunity for disadvantaged young people, for example. Uh, Michael and I wanted a movement for national service. But as soon as your organization starts to grow, 
more and more of your time and energy gets focused on, by necessity, building your organization. You've got to raise the money. You've got to take care of the board. You've got to take care of the clients, the core members, etc. You have less and less time for the movement. And so part of my goal would be the change, was to make it easy. I don't have to worry about the $60 million city or budget anymore, or the 1,500 core members, or the 75,000 children that we're serving across the country. So I could focus on the movement full time and then make it easier for other social entrepreneurs and practitioners to participate in the movement. So, uh, you know, I think you need both, basically. Yes? You mentioned earlier, in your, um, earlier that you sort of saw there being a place for degrees in social entrepreneurship and encouraging people to sort of become the next great social entrepreneur. However, we've had other speakers that have almost said to us that the social entrepreneurship world is saturated with too many people that want to just start and found organizations, and that instead people should be looking towards joining existing organizations. Where do you stand on that divide? I, 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 again, I think it's a false choice. I think, you know, um, there aren't too many people trying to start organizations. I mean, you know, think of all the issues and all the problems. And again, I mean, think of all the people that start small businesses in this country. I mean, I, I, I believe in entrepreneurship as a key strategy to make change. Uh, and But it also takes a certain kind of person to be a social entrepreneur. Um, you, you have to be, as Michael has said, thunderstruck. You, you have to have such a passion. It's like, you know, for me and Michael, we had to start City Year. When I went to Harvard Law School, I had jobs to go work on Wall Street and all that. And, but, you know, I just had to pursue this idea because I believed in it. So it's like Wendy out of, you know, Princeton had to start Teach for America. Dorothy Stoneman had to start youth. It's like, it's something that's just in you. Um, you know, my wife Vanessa, who's done three organizations. Um, and we need that. It's similar with people in the private sector. If you talk to entrepreneurs, you talk to Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or the Google guys, you know, it's just, so uh, we need that. And, and some will be successful and some won't. But then we also need people to join organizations. I mean, again, you know, City or my first thing on that top 20 tips for you, that I handed out in social entrepreneurship, find a partner and build a team. Nobody changes the world by themselves. Nobody launches a, a strong organization by themselves. Uh, nobody does anything by themselves that's, that's going to really have a big impact, um, unless you're a genius as an artist or somebody like that. So uh, you do need, I mean, you know, Michael and I get tagged as the founders of City Year, but the truth is there are about, you know, 20 founders of City Year, people who joined the organization in the first year and helped to, to make it happen. Um, so you need both. What we need mostly is more people like you all to get into this sector. If you've got a burning passion for an idea, try to start it. If you, if you don't, then pick an issue, an organization you care about, and try to grow it. Um, we, we need both. Yeah. Um, I found the interplay between the identity and services and just taking like, national democratic um, leadership and making sure that Um, yeah, one of the things I learned around, when I traveled around the world was that this is a global idea. There's, there's you know, service efforts going all over the world, and I do think, uh, and there is a global service movement happening. There are organizations that are, and I think we need that, and I think there are some ideas that, I think we should have a global service corps. I mean, imagine if you had uh, a group of young people from 100 different countries coming together to work on issues of AIDS or poverty or the environment around the world. Um, I think that's sort of like a 21st century version of the Peace Corps. It shouldn't just be Americans going out. It should be people coming together. Um, just think of what that would be like. Uh, I think there should be service uh, initiatives going on in different, I mean, part of the reason I was drawn to South Africa was because it was so dynamic as a new democracy and we were literally pulled there. Um, and so I do think this is a global idea and it should be a global, I mean, it would be incredible if, you know, young people all over the world grew up saying, I'm going to spend a year in service. Some would do it in their own neighborhood. Some would do it in their country. Some would go to other countries. Some would do it uh, with people from their own community. Some could do it with people from other countries. So it's, a, it's I think it's foundational um, as a strategy for making change. So I think we could do it all over the world. And, and you know, we could see that happen over the, this, this century. Yeah. Yes. Um, I wanted to know 
what are some of your ideas for engaging adults um, who are busy with work? Yeah. Um, well, the interesting thing is when we put together the Service Nation policy agenda, and you can see it on our website, www.servicenation.org, it, it really spans the spectrum, starting you know as early with service learning for kids in kindergarten all the way through people in the retired years. And I actually think the next big frontier for uh, national service is the baby boom generation. People are living longer. They're healthy. They grew up in the 60s. They still have that desire to change the world. Now they have the time and the energy and, and well before the stock market crashed they had the resources a number of them did um, but they still do and and there's a really interest I mean the AARP was one of our leading partners in the service nation coalition because they're listening to their customers people from the baby boom generation don't want to retire the way their parents did they don't want to just go play golf or you know stay by the beach or, or, or just hang out um, and you know there's a huge generation there that has experience and, and, and can really you know do quality work and there's some great programs that are doing that, like Experience Corps and others. So uh, we actually put together an agenda that could facilitate that. Another piece of the agenda, another big part of the movement is uh, companies doing service. Timberland, which was one of the lead sponsors of City Breakthrough, something like 10, 15 years ago, Jeff Swartz uh, created a week, a new employee benefit. I mean, most companies give time off for vacation, give health care, et cetera, some kind of retirement. Jeff added a week of paid time to do community service. You choose. You want to go build, do a build with Habitat for a week. You want to tutor, uh, you know, an hour a week at your kid's school, uh, every week of the year. You, you know, basically 40 hours. You can use whatever you want. Um, there are more and more companies now that are doing employee service days or giving a day or two days or three days. Um, so I think that's a possibility. Uh, there, there needs to be a range of options for people. I, I'd like to get to a day in the country <coughs> where when people meet each other. You know, people often talk about their interests, their family, their work. People would ask, where do you serve? Because it's just become so universal. Everybody's serving somewhere um, as part of just their their ethic. Yes? Um, so you said you spent a year um, traveling and wanting to be social entrepreneurs. And I'm wondering um, how you prepare for something like that and how you find the people and how you track them down if, like, we want to go out and meet these people, too. Um, well, we had an advantage in that, uh, well, we're, we're both entrepreneurial, Vanessa and I, and because we'd started City and Public Allies, we had networks. We had private sector networks, so, you know, any company that had supported us and was operating around the world, we contacted them. We had foundation networks. Uh, we had fellow social entrepreneurs. A huge network for us was Ashoka, and I don't know if you guys have studied Bill Drain, but he's the god for this whole movement. He visited Oh, yeah, that's right. I saw that. Yeah, Bill is a genius. I mean, I, I realized this. We interviewed at least 75 Ashoka Fellows, and I realized Bill Drayton's a genius because it, it, to a person they were extraordinary. I think they were from 10 different countries and t you know, all different kinds of social entrepreneurial efforts. Extraordinary people. And you know, how he's managed to build that and make it a global institution. So that was a big network. We had friends in the media. So you know, we had uh, a bureau chiefs from US News and the Boston Globe and uh, Wall Street Journal and others. We just basically, we spent two months going through our networks. We had a little mission statement, and you know, some cases we emailed, some cases we faxed. I mean, it'd be so much easier now because you got Facebook, and and the internet is so much more developed. Um, but but then we also we were like journalists. I mean, we also I mean, the hardest thing for us was we land in a new place, we pull out our list, and we decide, okay, who's going to pick up the phone and start making the initial phone calls? Like, you know, hi, we're so and so. Bill Drayton said we should call you, or you know, so and so said we should call you. We tapped the government. We had friends in the Clinton administration because of our work there. So we had folks from USAID and from other government places. So we just basically put it together. But what we found was, um, especially when you, I mean, a lot of Americans go to Europe. Um, we traveled in you know, Asia and Africa and the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Uh, and we, people were totally welcoming. I mean, it was an extraordinary experience. You know, people would take you know, a day off and, and show us their, their organizations, their program. People would invite us to stay in their homes. Um, it was really, because it was rare. You know, you have these two young Americans traveling the world, trying to learn from other people. There were people also inspired by that. We just said, we're, we want, we're going to learn from you. We interviewed, I don't know, 350, 375 people. So you can do it. I think uh, if you did this now, um, you could use technology in a different way. And, you know, you could find people. Yes? Um. I heard you mention that there are 1,500 people uh, that are working in the city right now. And you also mentioned 
uh, closer to having about a million people doing it. Now, you know, there is a gap. And do you feel that in the city you could feel that gap? Or is there a way of replicating what you're doing within the country? Yeah. Um, well, the, the Serve America Act, which just got signed last week by the president, is going to grow AmeriCorps to 250,000 people. So that's a, a quantum leap. You know, our goal from the very beginning, Michael, I said we want to see a million people doing this every year. So we're still not there. It's not going to be city year. It's, it's, you know, it could be AmeriCorps. Um, my hope is that as AmeriCorps gets to 250,000 people a year, every four years we'll have another million alumni, that that group will then you know, help to lead to a tipping point. Where, and as we see the impact, uh, on the, when we get to critical mass, I mean, at 75,000 people, it's not really at critical mass. Once we get to 250,000 people, the other breakthrough with the Serve America Act is that there are focused problem-solving cores. There's an education core, an opportunity core to focus on poverty, a clean energy core to focus on the environment, et cetera. That will also drive demand to grow. So I hope that this is sort of seen as like the next plateau, and then we'll get to um, a larger tipping point. Uh, it won't be Sidier. Sidier could end up being 5,000, maybe 10,000 out of that 250,000 or a million. But it could grow now. I think it could get there. Yes? Yeah, so I think a number of uh, questions would be enough to just uh, like say this uh, for you. Um, I guess sometimes this uh, presents sort of like a, a false choice between sort of like um, spending a year uh, off to bed and maybe like following uh, a, a career. I was wondering uh, if you consider sort of like partnering with some businesses such that maybe like um, they accept students from the for a year and like uh, work and they continue and, and start working. Yeah. It's a great idea. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a great idea. We hadn't really done that. Um, some of that's happening naturally now, just because of the economy. You know, people were given job offers, you know, last fall, and now they're going back. Like Bain and Company actually has a partnership with City, or I had nothing to do with it. I've, I've been gone for two and a half years, where they're saying to their, uh, their new folks coming in, and Bain's been a long-time partner, um, we'll, we, we don't have the capacity to start you. Uh, you know, normally they start over the summer or September. We'll start you in January, but they're going to pay people not what they normally get paid, but they're going to pay them a stipend to spend a semester at City Year, um, for example. Uh, Goodwin, Proctor, and Hoare, a law firm. And there are a number of law firms doing this, doing a similar thing with their incoming class of, of lawyers. They're saying, uh, we'll pay you a stipend, not what you get paid, but you can go work with, uh, they're a partner with New Profit, my wife's organization, which has like 20 different organizations that they're supporting. Uh, and they're going to send their lawyers to any one of those 20. Um, so I think it's a great idea. And hopefully this may become a trend that, that what companies realize is, hey, this is a great thing. And what people realize is, and so it will last beyond this economic crisis. Um, I think it's a good idea. But that leads me to ask you guys a question. A lot of you said you knew about AmeriCorps, but very few of you want to do it. Why is that? Anybody want to take that on? Yes. Oh, I, I personally want to. I, would, I wouldn't mind doing it, but I think the fact that... <laughs> no, I'm, 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 um, that was not the question. Right? Yeah, no, I'll answer though. Uh, but there's always the, the, the idea in the back of your mind that I mean, we're all Harvard students, and I feel like we have a lot of opportunities um, in terms of career, in terms of other things. So sometimes, I mean, kind of a selfish thing, but it's like, should I take a year of my life to like give back and do service, or should I should I use my youth to try to build myself and then eventually do something like that? I mean, that's just my thought on that. Yes? There was actually an article in the Boston Globe the other day that was about the law students that he led. Some of the law students here are talking about some student that Harvard Law was hired by all of the firm in Washington, and the title of the article was Law Students Deferring uh, or law students taking a detour on the road to success, um, which just kind of, it gives this article, I mean, the article really, I think, sums up the the idea that you're talking about a lot, where there's this idea among, you know, a lot of really motivated people that doing public service for a year would be, you know, a detour from this, you know, getting a big law firm job or working in a consulting firm, and I think that that's a general ethos that, like, is slowly changing, but it definitely needs a lot more work mm -hmm. to have a lot more people like, engage with these activities. And we also, yeah. Okay. Um, have like a passion to start our own thing so right. this sort of like a year of service versus like something that you're starting on your own and enabling other people to um, sort of you know um, get into the service movement so that might also be like a detractor from like personal direct service. Well, 
I think, yeah, you had something on it. Oh, well, not, not related to that. Okay, well, let me just make one comment then. Uh, you know, this reminds me, I think this is part of the culture that we have to shift. Um, you, know, I, you know, look, people should do what they want to do. Um, but this idea of, you know, it, it gets back to sort of this, you know, system we got to build. You know, some things are sort of socially regarded as successful and others aren't. Um, you know, when I was an intern that summer working for my congressperson, one of the things we had a chance to do was meet with Ralph Nader. Um, and I'll never forget the advice he gave us at that, and I, and I thought about it when I was deciding whether or not to do city or not, and I'll just share it with you all. Uh, you know, Ralph Nader said, it's in your 20s when you should take risks and follow your dreams and follow your heart, whatever it may be. If it's to go work on Wall Street, great. Um, but, but don't be afraid to take risks in your 20s because that's when you're going to be most passionate, most idealistic, uh, uh, and most free. As you get older, you know, people get married, they buy homes, they have mortgages, they have kids, and then your capacity to take risks shrinks dramatically. Um, so I would just encourage you that you want to be a social entrepreneur, you want to do something different, you don't want to you know, do what everybody else is doing. And I also think it is, it's going to be different if this economic crisis, I mean, already seniors from, I mean, Harvard's Harvard, you know, think about what it's like for people not at Harvard. But even Harvard seniors are not getting the kind of jobs in the private sector. So it may turn out that people find out, hey, you know, I went and did something in public service or I became a social entrepreneur and that was actually just as successful or more so and, and fed my soul. Yes. I think uh, just uh, someone called Abby Khalid, uh, who's the global citizen. I know Abby. She's done something interesting where she took the year after high school and before college. And that seems to be very attractive to people, uh, where you go out and experience uh, being service, and then you come back with ideas, actually. Right. You can spend the four years in college maybe thinking about it and doing something. So maybe you know that's, that's a different way of approaching it before actually start thinking about careers and having to make that compromise. Yes. Yeah, no, I think what Abby's doing is great. We're, we're, we're running out of time, so what I'd love to do is just, anybody who has a question, if you could at least just share your question, and maybe I could just try to do a summary comment. Sure. Mine's actually a follow-up about global citizen here, whether you think something like that could fall within AmeriCorps' mission, or whether AmeriCorps is a little bit better center. I'm going to address this a little bit, but in terms of funding, is that possible? Okay. government was the problem or was seen as a problem, and now people are thinking of government as a part of a solution to the problem. And I was wondering to what extent, because you were talking about funding for AmeriCorps, but also policy and also thinking globally. Is it just funding, resource um, allocation, or is it also policy? So, um, yeah, I was going to ask about, um, sort of following up on the conversation we were just having, what you think is are the cultural impediments to getting people like from Harvard and from and the, and the people who you do think need this sort of inspiration and um, to have their justice nerve turned on? You know why why aren't people getting more interested in serving and serving through AmeriCorps and what you think can be done about it? Uh, I was just curious as to you talked a little bit about the, um, how you use like grassroots mobilization um, in would be the change. I was curious kind of what different ideas and tactics you use for that and how much you think um, that kind of mobilization is important um, for like uh, service and social movements. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot about how AmeriCorps is mismanaged and efficient. Can you convince me that it's always with the program? <laughs> and Victoria. Um, it sort of relates to Lisa's question, but I was wondering how, um, I was wondering about the strategy behind city um, years recruitment process, especially in contrast to TFA. As a senior, I got a ton of emails like, from TFA people this year and, um, you know, none from city year. So I was wondering mm -hmm. that yeah. How do you reconcile the need for government funding for scalability and the volatility that you talked about with the United States? Great. Is that everybody? Right. Okay. Is that it? All right. I'll try and go this quickly. Um, Global Scissor AmeriCorps, uh, I think we absolutely need that. We should have a, basically an international branch of AmeriCorps. Uh, it's not the 1960s, it's not the Peace Corps anymore. There's a ton of international NGOs, and in fact, that was one of the things I've been advocating for. Is that you could totally expand the movement globally if there were, you know, uh, people like Abby should be able to get funding to do that. Um, government as a solution, new role for government. I wrote this Huffington Post piece. I think we need a new, 
approach to solving problems, a new public philosophy, if you will. And I think it's got to, I think we need to ask uh, for any problem. I, I don't think government is the solution. I don't think government's the problem. Government needs to be part of the answer, but not the exclusive answer. I think we need to ask, what's the role of citizens? What's the role of entrepreneurs, both private and social, because they help drive change and come up with the new ideas? What's the role for the government? Uh, what's the role for the private sector? And what's the role for the nonprofit sector? Big. Holistic solutions are going to take all five. And the government's role, I think, is, is crucial in that, both to help set the standards, the rules of the game, set big aspirational goals, but not to be the one that's driving you know, the delivery mechanism. Because I think government is bureaucratic. I've learned that. Um, and there's more than half post piece. Uh, cultural impediments, you guys might know better than I would. I think you know President Obama said he wants to make public service cool, and I think he already is, and I think that's going to help. The fact that he did the Serve America Act in the first 100 days, we've got this new legislation, that's going to help. Um, there are 35,000 people applying to Teach for America. In terms of our recruitment, it's changing. Um, uh, the difference between Sit Here and Teach for America, one of the differences, Teach for America doesn't run a program. It's a recruiting vehicle, basically. So their whole effort is to recruit you and then place you. Sit Here is both recruiting people, and then we run. I mean, we have teams, so it's harder um, to do it. That's partially an explanation. It's not an excuse. But it's also changing. I mean, we've learned from TFA, uh, and I think you're going to see um, more efforts coming. We just did a rebranding campaign, and that'll hopefully get better. Uh, grassroots mobilization is essential. Um, we did, you know, internet stuff. We did this big day of action. We leveraged the coalition. Um, I think that's key for any type of change that's coming. I think the you know, Obama election is, is proof of that. They ran the best grassroots campaign in history, and it's a big part of the reason that he won. Not the whole reason, but it's a big part of it. Um, how is AmeriCorps not wasteful? Uh, it's going to take more than two seconds. You know, there's studies that have shown that you know, for every dollar invested, there's $3 return. If you look at the alumni studies, if you go to the corporation website, um, there's been, you know, there are people who are opposed to AmeriCorps, so they pull out like the examples where uh, it's, you know, not worked or been, you know, some money's been wasted. You can find that in any government agency. I think part of the proof of the pudding is that we just did the Serve America Act to grow AmeriCorps, you know, five, threefold, and had huge overwhelming bipartisan support. Norm 79 senators, four only 19 against. 275 House members, 449 against. So, uh, and if you talk to people around the country who actually work in these programs, you'll see the impact. But that's probably a lot larger conversation. Uh, did I get everybody? Alan, thank you very much. Thank you. So that's what I think, you know, how we could actually reclaim that. Yes? funded in terms of money flowing like through the government into basically paying people to do service even though it's a small stipend and how does that get reconciled politically? Yeah, um, you know, this has been an issue that's come up and, and uh, if you want to have a diverse program, if you want this to be something that's universally available, people have to get, and you want people to be able to do it full time. And I do think there is a qualitative difference when you are full time engaged in, in an activity than part-time or episodically. I believe in volunteerism. I think it's important for people to, to volunteer. But I do think if you actually do it full-time, it's, it's, it's a different level of commitment and learning and engagement. And we've got studies that show that now. If you're going to do that, people have to get paid something. How do they pay their rent? How do they you know, ride the tea? How do they get their, pay for their lunch? Um, so there's got to be some kind of stipend uh, connected to that, unless you want to leave it just to the wealthiest of the wealthy. And you know that, that defeats the purpose because the idea is that everybody should be involved in this. So, uh, and well, your justice nerve. Uh, I think everybody has it, and sometimes it gets turned on early, sometimes it gets turned on late, sometimes it never gets turned on. But basically, if you come face to face with injustice, it's almost part of your DNA. This is true all over the world for people. You see it in times of crisis. You want to do something about it. And what I've seen is, if you spend a year full time engaged, day after day. Your justice nerve gets turned on, and then it doesn't go off once it's turned on. We, you know, we have studies of our alumni. City alumni vote at much higher rates than their peer groups. They continue to volunteer at much higher rates. They lead others into service at much higher rates. They maintain friendships with people from different backgrounds at much higher rates. They become better citizens. Um, and AmeriCorps just did a big study that also tracks that. So I think part of the way we could sort of, it's, you know, when we were in college and law school, you know, we used to talk about national service as the missing link in our democracy. I mean, you know, how do you make citizenship real for people? Active duty, not just studying in the classroom. I mean, a lot of you said you took this course because you wanted a practical experience. 
Well, a year of service actually gives you a practical experience in working on the needs of your community and your country and your world. So I think that would help a lot. I mean, it's interesting. We, you know, in other areas of public service, we have the all-volunteer army, and they get paid, and they should. We have firefighters and police officers and teachers, and they get paid, and they should. Members of Congress are public servants. They're doing public They get paid, and they should. So there's been this thing about, well, people doing AmeriCorps, why should they get paid? If they're full-time, how are they going to live? So again, I don't think it should be, and most people who are doing AmeriCorps could get paid you know, I mean, city of Corps members could work at McDonald's and actually make more money. Now, they wouldn't have as good an experience, and they're not contributing to the society. So um, I think it's essential if you want to achieve the goals. Yes? Do you think there's some sort of conflict in public service uh, programs between solving the problems of the recruiting volunteers for and serving the interests of the volunteers themselves? I mean, have you ever been asked the question, um, is volunteering or public service the best way of solving these problems? Should we put it out there? Um, I, I think we need to do both, and you know this comes up a lot. Is city or for the core members or for the kids we serve? What I learned over time is that uh, if you focus, yes. Um, that's a great point, and uh, I actually just wrote a piece for the Huffington Post, which I gave, which actually talks about that. Arthur Schlesinger had this whole cycles of history theory about exactly that, that we go through these cycles. Um, I actually think it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. I think if we did have a more uh, universal, voluntary national service system, we would stay more engaged in public purpose. Because people would have, it's part of the reason I've been such a big believer in this and have spent a lot of my life working towards it. What I've seen from City Year, from AmeriCorps, and there's now studies that show this, uh, if you spend a year full time working on uh, issues of inequality or poverty or educational opportunity or the environment, um, you turn on what I like to call, talk about the greatest generation. That's like now four generations ago. I mean, from, you know, it's your great grandparents' generation. Think about it. Why are they the greatest generation and why haven't we had one since? Because the whole generation got pulled into service either through the Depression, through World War II. Um, you know, men went off to fight the war. Women went into the workplace. They did the rubber drives, the tin drives. It was, everybody was in it together. And we still revere that generation, you know, from now 75 years ago. Um, so I think if we had this, every generation could become a greatest generation because you would have worked together. I mean, a lot of you raised the issue of education. You know, imagine if we had a million. I mean, 35,000 people apply to Teach for America this year. They've got enough money for 5,000 spots. You know, there are three million public school classrooms in this country. Imagine if we had a million people from your generation going into public school classrooms. That would even just cover a third of them. Um, and how would that do in terms of, A, the impact, and then, B, the generational commitment to, I mean, it's not a surprise that there are so many alumni of TFA that are on the cutting edge of education reform, whether it's Michelle Rhee in DC or the folks that founded KIPP or other efforts. 